Almost seven years ago, Bloodborne was unleashed. Ever since, I've been quietly playing Bloodborne during dark and stormy nights, and it's become one of my favorite games ever. In this video, I will be analyzing this bloody, enchanting, beautiful video game that I've come to know and love so much. We're going to be looking at a variety of different things, from combat mechanics to world design, aesthetics, bosses, the pros and the cons, and everything in between. We'll also talk about how well the game holds up from various player positions, such as first-timers versus long-time veterans. This is Bloodborne, almost seven years later. I think the first thing Bloodborne gets praised for is its atmosphere and its design, with the combat sometimes getting overshadowed. So let's start there instead. Do people like difficult games? I actually don't most of the time. I'm kind of impatient. I don't actually seek out hard games. So I'm a pretty terrible candidate for this game, even though I personally did connect to the Souls games in a very big way. I rather tend to gravitate towards the mechanics of games. I like AAA games that feel sophisticated and deep regardless if they're hard or easy. I just like when a game feels satisfying, good in my hands, and integrated well with the rest of the game's systems. Bloodborne actually feels sort of cumbersome at first. Perhaps it didn't seven years ago, but gone is the era of the 30 frames per second video game. Especially coming from Dark Souls 3 where you have an uncapped frame rate on PC. A higher frame rate has some extreme benefits for a video game, but is it objectively better? The answer to that is yes and no. There's two sides to the coin, and one of those is fluidity. The higher the frame rate, the smoother the game is, and in turn, the easier it is to control. Nobody can argue that. Not only are actions super responsive, this can be combats and moving around generally, but it also reduces player errors if you think about it. Timing combos in action or fighting games becomes easier, which could lead to a more sophisticated combat system. It's a lot easier as well to do a precise jump or traverse a catwalk with a higher frame rate. This could lead to more complex platforming or environmental challenges. This in itself has the potential to fundamentally change how game devs could design levels and game mechanics. The second is atmosphere. Games with lower frame rates can potentially provide better immersion. The standard frame rate for movies is 24 frames per second. 24 frames allows enough motion blur to resemble the natural way humans process moving objects, or at least as close as you can get on a screen. Since movies are a series of moving frames or pictures, it evokes that cinematic feel that we all know and love. Bloodborne is locked at 30 frames, which is very close to 24 frames, just like many PS4 games of the time, including Uncharted 4, The Last of Us, etc. From a purely visual perspective, Bloodborne is incredibly dreamy to look at, some would say bewitching because the cinematic feeling it gives off is impossible to capture at a higher frame rate. The particle effects, the motion blur, and just the way the game looks, how it was actually created from an artistic standpoint, it is just so engrossing at 30 frames. However, I'd never prefer this frame rate for a game just because it makes the game more atmospheric, because typically a lower frame rate can have a destructive element on gameplay, that being unresponsiveness. Like many other games at 30 frames, Bloodborne has a small delay when inputs are put in from the player to when the action takes place on the screen. This is called input delay. In combat, these delays can be milliseconds. However, you can still feel them, and it makes the gameplay feel sort of awkward at first if you've never played an old Souls game or if you've been playing on a high refresh rate monitor. To counter this, Bloodborne uses something called input buffering to make it easier for the player to execute their actions. Another thing it offers is something called invincibility frames. The hunter is briefly invincible while performing certain actions with the circle button, such as rolling and sidestepping. This was a mechanic carried over from all the other Souls games. Executing a roll through an enemy attack allows you to pass through it without taking damage. It looks like the attack should have clipped you, but you take no damage. This is called an iframe, or again, invincibility frame. This helps curve the frustration of Bloodborne's low frame rate and input lag, as it gives you a little bit of leeway. But for now though, let's stick to input buffering. With input buffering, when your character is performing an action in combat, you can input the next action while the first one is going through. This will queue up the second action, 
essentially storing it so it happens directly after the first action. This almost by itself is the foundation of the Bloodborne combat experience. For example, if you hit the R1 button to perform a basic attack and then hit the dodge button while your character is still in the attack animation, you will dodge directly after your attack. If you do the same attack but double tap the circle, you'll roll. This can be done in any direction, including back dodging and side jumping. Input buffering also works with trick weapon swapping and power attacks. For example, light attack, light attack, side roll, visceral attack. Or light, light trick, back step, strong. Input buffering also affects spells, running attacks, and parry inputs with your offhand. You can pull off some pretty sick combos when you combine all the various mechanics, and the input buffering simply makes it easier to queue up those actions without requiring precise timing. For all the fighting game fans out there, you don't have to be frame perfect with your inputs. That's what they would say. This easier execution can however lead you to throwing out extra pointless swings and rolls because you're not totally sure if your next input has been queued up. I covered this issue in my Mass Effect Andromeda video when it came to riders jumping. It's the same issue. For example, you might hit attack and then hit circle. However, in this split second, you're worried you hit circle too soon and you input circle again to make sure the game registered it. This will cause you to attack and suddenly dodge twice or instead roll, since two-tapping circle is the roll input. This is the downside. Did the game register my input or not? This is the uncertainty of input buffering. I mean, it wouldn't be a From Software game if people weren't rolling off cliffs to their death on accident, right? In a game where enemies can kill you in the blink of an eye, it can make for a combat system that at first feels slightly less responsive than it should be. Part of the issue is the controller setup, as many movement actions are tied to the circle button. Sprint, dodge, jump, and dash, that is four incredibly important elements sharing a universal input. This is very uncommon for video games, for obvious reasons, and it's plausible from set it up this way because, well, A, they had only so many buttons, and B, because there's input buffering and lag to the hunter's moveset. If there were no input delay, you can imagine a very common problem with this button. You press the circle to back dodge, but then a split second later, you push the directional stick forward because you want to move afterwards. Well, what happens? You wouldn't back step, you would do a front step. And then there's the issue of sprinting, which is again solved by input delay. This one, again, is very obvious. You're sprinting and you want to roll, so the game waits for you to release the circle button before doing the roll, as otherwise you would roll every time you wanted to start sprinting. Low input delay is important for things like competitive first-person shooters or fighting games, but in Bloodborne it's less of an issue overall because the majority of attacks are highly telegraphed. For most of the game, it works very well to prevent people mashing through the game, even though the buffering system can cause some unwanted guesswork. It's really only a problem at all with the game's most difficult bosses like Lady Maria, the Orphan of Costs, and the giant fish guys in the fishing hamlet, the latter of which borders on complete bullshit if you ask me, but that's a different story. When attacks are so sudden and lurching, the system is stretched to its limit. This is likely why the rally system was introduced. Note that Bloodborne sticks to what is called the 50% rule, which means the first input must be at least 50% finished before you queue up the second. If it's under 50%, the next action will not be stored and you will just sit there with your thumb up your butt. Given the inherent delay a low frame rate causes, this window is incredibly minuscule. Remember, the 50% rule is used to punish button mashing, which if you think about the essence of Bloodborne, it perfectly fits in with its frenetic combat. Enemies are faster, more aggressive, and they often come at you in packs. They're also pretty damn unpredictable and very spazzy. So it's only natural players are going to be more prone to panic button hammering, which is the exact reason why input buffering is designed the way it is here, to make sure you don't. What also discourages button mashing is the fact that you cannot cancel actions in Bloodborne. Many action games allow canceling, in which you can cancel or stop an attack that is midway through its animation into another action. A typical example of this is a game that lets you cancel a punch combo or a special move into a dodge or backstep. You input your combo, light punch, heavy kick, but you realize when the punch is going through that your opponent is about to hit you with an uppercut. In this game, the uppercut happens to be plus on block, meaning after he blocks your heavy kick, he will have the frame advantage and will hit you with that uppercut, guaranteed. So you want to cancel that heavy kick. In this game, unlike Bloodborne, you can cancel it while the punch is being blocked by quickly hitting dodge. This will allow you to escape the incoming uppercut. If this was Street Fighter, you would call this an FADC and you'd spend some meter on it. 
You can apply this concept to a variety of games, including footsies and dive cancels in fighting games or with general combat systems in third-person action games. I demoed how you can cancel just about every combo string with Bayek into a dodge in Assassin's Creed Origins. This is essentially a safety net for the player, the get out of jail free card if you will. Bloodborne games do not allow this, which makes them unique in the sense that you must commit to each attack. Along with some slight input delay caused by the lower frame rate, this is what makes the games more action RPG than action games, and obviously what makes the game difficult. You can't just bail out of an attack by smashing dodge in a panic frenzy. You have to make sure every attack you input is the right one, and if it's not, you're typically punished for it. Essentially, you can view Bloodborne as less about pure skill and reactions and more about tactics. There are some exceptions to this while you're playing, but I think that's generally a good way to look at it. In Dark Souls, this created very defensive style gameplay though. It was generally a good idea to throw up your shield, block enemy attacks, and wait for a safe opening. This was complementary to the stamina system, which required careful management. You'd never want to deplete your gauge completely and leave yourself open to a free hit. The two systems were like peanut butter and jelly, it's the perfect match. With Bloodborne, you get the same commitment style gameplay, again with the same irritations brought on by the lower frame rates and the input buffering. However, of course, it's offset by some new systems that make it even more interesting. And the first one is trick weapons. In place of a huge arsenal of weapons that generally all act the same within their specific categories, Bloodborne offers a smaller selection of weapons, but each with their own trick mechanic. By pressing L1, you can swap to your trick version. For example, the Kirk Hammer is a one-handed sword by default, and its trick version is a giant hammer. Essentially, you get two weapons in one. Also, if you're mid-combo, hitting L1 will execute a trick attack, which gives you an extra attack and the transformation in the same input. It's very cool. This has a lot of uses, and it depends on the range you're at, but it's primarily used to keep the enemy staggered while swapping to your trick weapon. It's slightly situational, however, in combination with the various attacks you can do with each version, it makes for From Software's most sophisticated combat system. Not to mention, the animations are absolutely sick. Trick weapons also solve the problem other Souls games have, of forcing the player to swap weapons to get a different moveset. In most Souls games, weapons have a very limited moveset. Most attack patterns are either slash or thrust. Slash being mostly horizontal swiping. Think sword, a one-handed axe, mace, versus thrust, which is horizontal stabbing. Think spear or rapier. Rare are weapons that actually have a mixture of the two. Think scythe. Slash weapons are good because they travel from right to left, and they cover a lot of horizontal screen space, allowing you to cleave multiple enemies. This is especially important with low poise enemies, as you can essentially stun lock a group of them. Thrust weapons, on the other hand, are sought after because you can poke enemies without being exposed to their attacks. The extended range of a spear can make many encounters a sword struggles with fairly easy, actually. It's important to have a thrust weapon for claustrophobic areas like a castle environment with narrow hallways. The Ice Rapier from Dark Souls 2 is an example of a very good thrust weapon. However, you don't get any slash attacks, which can be problematic for enemies that move fast or bounce around as you can easily miss them. Maybe this is why Bloodborne has trick weapons, as enemies are faster, more aggressive, and can fling themselves all over the screen in the blink of an eye. And they also have a much more diverse, spazzy moveset. Without having multiple attacks on a single weapon, you might be ill-equipped to deal with such unpredictable challenges. For example, a great first weapon for new players is Ludwig's Holy Blade, because it has a slash moveset untricked, and a thrust with its trick version. It covers the bases of 2-3 weapons in any prior Souls game, and is a huge evolution from weapon arts from Dark Souls 3. Bouncing between weapons isn't a hassle for most games, but Souls rely on the D-pad for swapping weapons. This is a lot different than a weapon wheel or quick swapping from a shoulder button. Swapping weapons in any Souls game is very annoying because it just doesn't feel natural. You either have to reach for the D-pad with your left hand, which makes your character stop moving, or you reach with your right hand, which means you can't roll, dodge, or use a potion, or basically do anything other than move. Obviously some will use multiple weapons, so they'll have to use the D-pad as well, but much less often considering most weapons transform into completely new versions with entirely different movesets essentially functioning as two or more different weapons. The rifle spear transforms from a spear to a gun, the jigsaw from a one-hand mace to a two-hand buzzsaw, the threaded cane swaps into a whip, changing the weapon into a crowd control machine, and there's even a sword that transforms into a bow. My personal favorite weapon is the Blades of Mercy, and it's really awesome deadly moveset. 
Not only are the trick weapons very imaginative and a lot of fun to use, but they expand combat options which keeps things fresh. Most weapons have a mixture of attacks that makes them very useful against different enemies and situations. For example, the Kirkhammer has a 4 hit swiping combo, a thrust and charge attack, a 2 hit hammer combo, a charge smash hammer attack, an overhead bash charge, a ground smash transformation attack, and an overhead sword transformation attack. Not to mention the four leaping heavy attacks, backstab attacks, four dodge fast attacks, and sprinting attacks with each version of the weapon. Now consider if you want to poise break in hammer mode or parry with a one-handed mode. Again, it all depends on the situation. This is an incredible amount of variety compared to any Souls game, and it's only one trick weapon. It gets even more interesting though. Upon further inspection, the input delay allows for several secret attacks depending on how long the player has waited to input their next action. Take this basic combo with the Beast Hunter safe. Roll forwards, R1. The Hunter does an uppercut slash to close the distance. It's a very nice attack. However, waiting about a quarter of a second after rolling to hit R1 results in this. A fast, horizontal slash. This applies to trick weapons too. Swapping from two-hand trick to silver sword with Ludwig's holy blade can either result in a normal slash or an overhead attack. This is again depending on how the inputs are put in by the player. It really doesn't add that much to the gameplay, it's again very situational at best. But it's very cool to see these little minute nuances in the combat system that many people don't even know about. Another example is what I call the pivot backstep, which is an advanced gameplay mechanic only possible with the input lag system that was put in place. If you hit circle and then immediately move to the side with a directional stick, you'll actually turn or pivot to the side. This allows you to do a side dash without being locked on. It's fairly ghetto and you'll probably never use it. However, it's just an example of how microscopic some of the systems get in this game, thanks to the input lag, which is often not a preferable game mechanic. Now combine all of that with the Hunter's tools, most of which can be used at 15 arcane, which is a relatively low amount, and you've got a very diverse, very imaginative, flexible combat system that goes way beyond what was served up with past Souls games. While there are fewer weapons on offer, they are more interesting, varied, and foster creativity. And the best part is, any weapon is viable, allowing you to focus on the combat and just finding the weapon that you connect with, rather than on hemming and hawing over where you want to spend your upgrade materials on. Bloodborne also streamlined a lot of smaller gameplay mechanics that were often misunderstood and poorly integrated from other Souls games. Again, freeing up the player from having to mess around with unnecessary things. The biggest was Poise, which to this day is one of the most confusing and convoluted systems ever put into these titles. Poise was a stat in Dark Souls 1 that increased your resistance to being staggered and stunlocked as an effect of taking hits from opponents. Staggered refers to your attack being interrupted and is a serious issue when facing enemies with heavy weapons. Stunlock has more ramifications for PvP and is certain death in PvE when surrounded by multiple enemies. High Poise allows you to complete an attack despite being hit yourself, and this was affected by items in the Souls franchise. The thing was, players were never really sure what actually gave you Poise. Some argued it was from armor. The heavier the armor, the more Poise you had. Others said weapons. The bigger the weapon, the higher the Poise. And others thought it was based on equip load. The higher the equip load, the higher the poise. You get the picture. It's all very arbitrary to the average player, poise especially, but also equip load, which gave players quicker rolls based on how heavy they were. The game never explicitly tells you what these thresholds are. You literally have to do the math yourself. And when something is that cryptic in a video game, chances are it should probably be streamlined. Bloodborne streamlines both letting players focus on playing the game and selecting the gear that they just think is cool. Poise has been replaced by Hyper Armor instead, which is a much simpler mechanic that Dark Souls 3 implemented, yet it did so quite sloppily. In Bloodborne, most weapons have some degree of Hyper Armor built into their various attacks instead, the big weapons being the ones with the most, such as the Kirkhammer. Most charge-up attacks also have Hyper Armor, especially ones that proc visceral attacks, which is indicated by the blue flash. This is actually a great supplementary mechanic because it blends perfectly with the rally mechanic. Because players can choose to take the initial blow of an enemy knowing that they're going to recover the HP back as soon as they trade blows. For example, you can use the charged R2 attack on the Hunter's Axe and immediately rally back most of the damage you eat from doing it. The most important effect though is that it takes the mechanic itself and puts it directly in the hands of the player instead of the stat sheet, giving essentially the same effect but in a way that offers players more flexibility. And that's very important with Hyper Armor, because it's a system that was once governed by a completely binary decision. 
Do you have it or do you not have it? If not, too bad. As was fat rolling. You either had fast rolls or you were a chunky boy. Bloodborne doesn't have the traditional equip load system. Everyone rolls the same distance regardless what armor you have on. By removing these archaic systems, Bloodborne allows you to focus on the game itself and just enjoy yourself and deal with the challenges it throws at you without having to micromanage too much. However, it wouldn't be a From game if there wasn't something lurking inside that didn't require a PhD to figure out, and that is the secret stamina weight system. Again, Bloodborne doesn't have the traditional equip load system. In fact, there's not even a mention of it on the stat screen. However, there seems to be some internal tracking of it, and that is the number that governs regeneration penalties. To make a long story short, if you're under a certain weight, call it overweight you'll regenerate stamina slower than if you were under that weight limit. Upon testing, it seems like this isn't based on a linear function, rather there are several tiers. And if you break that tier, you're penalized. Leveling endurance seems to have little to no effect on this, however vitality might. The more vitality you have, the less you're affected, so theoretically investing into that trait makes it easier to fall under those thresholds. So essentially being chonky makes your stamina recovery go a little bit slower. There is, though, no effect on roll distance, iframes, gameplay, or animations as far as I can tell. This actually makes complete sense and is a staple design feature in many milsim shooters. It really doesn't make that much, if any, noticeable difference, and it makes you wonder why they just don't tell us about this kind of stuff. Perhaps they didn't notice it until the game shipped, and they just let it be. I don't know. With all of the technical crap out of the way, let's just say that the combat in Bloodborne is tremendously satisfying. The squishy gush sound effects and the blood splattering that cover the hunter in a fountain of red dripping is one of my favorite touches. There's a real progressive nature to the combat, in the sense that it becomes increasingly deep and rewarding the more you play. You start off as a pile of shit, in fact the game begins and you're supposed to die to the first enemy. But, like the best of souls, your achievements are your successes. There's no phoned in checklist of things to do. And there's certainly no arbitrary progression. The exploration of the world, the story, and the path from the start to the finish is fully and utterly up to you, which makes your successes sweeter than they otherwise be. The game revolves around you making mistakes and learning from them, analyzing why you died and coming back to the same scenarios with a new mindset. So much of the game is a cycle of life and death, which is an eerie parallel to the main theme of Bloodborne, and quite honestly, the entire narrative angle. It is frustrating, and I used to think I could never beat this game a long time ago, but each time I came back to it, I realized, you know what, my failures only made me stronger. And the moment you beat the boss that has whipped your ass bloody and raw for the past four hours is a feeling that surpasses the best of what gaming has to offer. No one can take away the joy you get from actually getting better at a game that demands that you do so. You can play a game for its story, you can play a game for its music, its art, anything you want to, but for me, it's the gameplay that keeps me coming back for more. Bloodborne is not only super enjoyable, but the sense of achievement is just so awesome and evermore. You do truly feel like a king by the end of the game, gathering all these cool weapons and spells, defeating some of the crazy craziest ass bosses in the Souls arsenal, just feeling absolutely filled with achievement. What I like about the bosses in Bloodborne is that there isn't any artificiality to them. What I mean by this is, sometimes in the Souls games, you'd find a boss that was put in just to fuck certain builds over. A pretty obvious and completely obnoxious example is the Smelter Demon in Dark Souls 2, which can be a horrific fight for a first time player who's using a melee build. And other times it was a broken magic system such as with Demon Souls, which favored sorcery. Bloodborne is the opposite. Every single build and weapon is capable of taking you from the start to the finish, with no hiccups in between or hard blockades just to piss you off. You can upgrade anything you want and have it work out, any build you choose. In fact, they give you one of the most powerful weapons at the start of the game. And on the flip side, the game never discourages any type of play or style. It actually gives you incredible flexibility, again, thanks to the trick weapon setup, which has an additional function. Some weapons have hidden damage modifiers, such as Serration, which gives 20% extra damage to beasts. There's a lot of beasts in Bloodborne, so having access to Serration is actually quite handy. You also have Righteous, which is the same equivalent but for Kin. They make good use of these mechanics by having some trick weapons have normal damage for one mode and amplify damage on its trick version. This is the case for the Saw Cleaver, which is serrated in its one hand form. So not only does Bloodborne not have any bullshit bosses that makes you question why you went this build instead of another, because oh my god suddenly it's so goddamn hard, you're actively encouraged to experiment with these mechanics, and arcane magic mind you, to make things even easier no matter what style you're playing. The only problem that 4 playthroughs expose is that perhaps too many of the beast bosses function the same. Bloodborne simply has too many giant flailing four-legged monsters. They're incredibly well designed, again what demented minds conjured up such creatures? But the general strategy, most often than not, is to get underneath them and hack them down. Run out, watch as the boss flails around, run in and repeat. And for Bloodborne, you can certainly lump at least five of the fights into that bucket. 
big beast horse dog thing go smashy smash. For a first run through of the game, this actually is completely obfuscated. All the bosses are exciting because they have great presentations and they're really fun to fight. But multiple new game pluses can result in some sameness as many battles operate in a similar manner. However, this isn't exactly new to the Souls franchise and with the restraints of game mechanics, it means that there will be some crossover, especially when we're on like boss 100 now when adding up all the Souls games. I mean, how many 30 foot knights with giant weapons have we fought over the years that had the same basic movesets? More sophisticated fights do exist, and I think Bloodborne has two of the best fights in the series, which are Lady Maria and the Orphan of Koss. You can cheese them, but if you fight them straight up, they'll give you a bloody good challenge and you'll be grinning from ear to ear once you've conquered them. You could also throw Father Giscoin and Garamond in there, though lower down on that list, but they're still very good. I really like the Maria fight in particular because the combination of her being extremely fast but having low poise is really ideal for Bloodborne's combat system. You're able to be extremely aggressive, but if you continue to swing mercilessly, she will eventually back off and then attack you when your stamina is low. You have to use the rally system smartly, you have to be very cautious but aggressive at the same time, the parry windows are tight but they're doable, and it's overall a very fair but vicious fight that is extremely exciting, and the music is phenomenal in the background. It is a fight that really exemplifies Bloodborne's combat system of rewarding good balance between aggressive and smart tactical play, which is fundamental for Bloodborne's combat system, and this is mirrored in the Orphan fight. We also get some interesting multi-boss fights, which function a lot better here than let's say Dark Souls 2 due to the enhanced agility of our hunter, case in point the Shadow of Yharnam. Shadows is a fairly difficult fight, but the thing is it just plays out so much differently than some of the other bosses in this game without going too far off the rails. And I really enjoyed it because it makes you think about how the enemies are going to die since they take on the powers of their fallen brothers. Ligarius too is a nice change of pace and a ruthless fight with some cool mechanics. He's also the climax of the very, very strong Kanehurst castle, so fighting him atop the snowy rafters of the castle is just plain awesome. But then, like most Souls games, we get the experimental bosses, for better or worse. Bosses that you could tell from software tried a little bit hard to feel separated from the traditional boss fights, but perhaps they just didn't quite hit the mark. The Witches of Hemwick have an interesting concept with the whole Mirage mechanic, but there's simply no challenge. Her grab attack also makes the whole fight rather annoying. Mikalash sounds like a good idea on paper. Crazy mad scientist guy who you have to chase down through a series of winding stairs, pathways, and drop downs. The presentation, dialogue, and music are really, really good, but it just isn't that fun. As the ads are too weak to put up a challenge, there's no traps, and the environment is purposely designed to get you fucking lost. When you finally catch up to him, not only do you have to do the whole process again, but you're at the mercy of his arcane one-shot spell which has a questionable hitbox. It doesn't help that otherwise, he's a giant punching bag. Living Failures suffers from having too big of a health pool. The design is novel, but ends up feeling fairly boring, almost a chore. The problem is, all four mobs are identical, and they have very limited movesets. It might have been a better idea to disregard lore on this one and give them each a special ability. The meteor attack that can two-shot you is also something I'm not terribly fond of because it's too difficult to track where it's going to land. Plus, great, it's AoE. So, sometimes you get hit even if you dodge at the right time. Moving on to the big gooey blue alien fights, most people regard this as the game's pinwheel joke boss, and it is, but it had the potential to be really, really cool. The alien design is amazing, actually, but it just suffers from the opposite problem of living failures. The boss doesn't have enough HP, and its laser attack isn't used enough to make it a challenge. While you have to give them some credit for thinking outside the box, these fights can come across rather gimmicky, but it's a Soulsborne game, so it's always a mixed bag in the boss department. The art design, however, is amazing across the board, which we'll cover a little bit more in the next section of this video. For now, let's finish up the combat discussion as there is one more main element I want to touch on, which is the parry. <laughs> To make a long point short, the parry mechanic is a lot better integrated here, because it's now a core gameplay mechanic that can be used with any weapon. In prior games you had to have a shield, but in Bloodborne you can always parry assuming that you're in the one-handed trick version of your weapon. Part of the reason it's better is because it's less risky, because you can parry at long range. And if you miss, you're often out of range of the enemy attack anyway. But if you land it, it opens up a visceral attack. The window for the visceral is very short though, so you often have to do a forward dash in order to close the distance to activate it. This is a nice small touch because it forces you not to spam the parry button. If the window is longer, you could parry twice aka spam it and still have enough time to pull off the visceral attack. 
Instead, you have to commit to the parry with a single shot, unless of course you're not concerned about the visceral. So what we have with the parry system in Bloodborne is a mechanic that fundamentally serves the exact same purpose, yet is perfectly blended into the title, is less risky with faster startups and recovery, and is just more satisfying. Now, Rally is very interesting because it works surprisingly well, but it does have limitations, as the leeway it gives you to be aggressive can be very situational. It works really well early on when enemies only take away 10 to 20% of your health with a single hit, since there's actually incentive to go back in for quick hits to get your health back. More so when you know they're not going to follow up with a flurry of attacks that would stagger you. You kind of feel like a boxer because there's some give and take. But once you hit later in the game, the system becomes a lot more supplementary. Enemies can hit you for 50% of your health or more, and you only get a small chunk of that back when you counterattack unless you pull off a parry visceral combo, meaning you could possibly die if you rally at the wrong time, even if you manage to successfully counterattack. Like a boxer fighting Mike Tyson, it might not be worth it to trade blows knowing he's likely going to put you to sleep if you do so. So while it's one of my favorite mechanics in the game, and it almost defines Bloodborne's combat system, as the game goes on, it becomes less utilitarian. And you know, that's fine. It's a tool in the Bloodborne toolbox, and you don't always have to use all of those tools. So overall, after my exhaustive ranting that was probably a little bit pointless, I'll just say that the combat is pretty amazing in Bloodborne, and I love the tweaks to the dodge, parry, rally, and trick weapon system. Farming for blood vials is kind of lame, but I like how you can have over 20. Having a higher potion count allows you to play more aggressive and loose, which is the mainstay of Bloodborne's combat after all. And the bosses are overall stellar. They have amazing designs and they give you an incredible challenge. It is beautiful, enchanting stuff. I mean, just look at some of these boss arenas. Eerie, sometimes heart-pounding, horrifying music tromps in the background as you carve your way through their petrifying cries of anguish and death. The atmosphere and immersion in Bloodborne is on another level. But more than anything, they give you that triumphant sense of challenge and achievement that in turn makes you feel accomplished in a way that no other damn game could ever capture. All right, let's talk about the world design of Bloodborne. So players will be starting in Central Yarnum, which right off the bat is one of the most amazing starter levels in Souls games. This area is one of, if not the hardest areas in the entire game relative to how much skill the player currently has, which is zero. It's important for the first level of a From game to be very challenging because it sets up the expectations for the rest of the game. Conventional game design states that a game should be progressively hard. Easy early game for learning, moderate challenge mid game to hone skills, and greater challenge in the late game to test those skills. This is typically the design blueprint for most video games, as it allows the widest set of skill levels to enjoy and finish the game. Souls games don't set up their structures this way. They always throw you in head first. Genuinely, they don't care how uncomfortable you are and how difficult the learning curve is, and Yarnum is no exception. Central Yarnum is designed in a way that teaches players everything they need to know, while at the same time creating the same expectations for all players, and that's what makes it a really great level. The main obstacles in this level beyond the bosses are the Executioner, the large group of huntsmen at the bonfire, and the two werewolves at the Great Bridge. All of these enemies can be reached within just a few minutes of starting the game and can obliterate any new player. This by itself is proof enough that Bloodborne is not fucking around. However, this is not a coincidence. Each one of these teaches you a different element of the game that it expects you to learn by the end, and there's a reason they're placed at the very beginning of the game. The Executioner has massive health and armor. R1 attacks barely do any damage to him, so it's best dealt with by using parries, which can two-shot him. So, you learn parries. This enemy also heavily punishes back dodging with its lunge jump attack that can nearly one-shot you. This is probably the best lesson you can learn in the entire first level, as most boss attacks are better avoided by jumping into the side of them rather than away from them. The wolves teach you to respect enemy speed, gap closers, and to be aware of your surroundings. Dodging into the side of the bridge is almost the best way to get yourself killed. And most importantly, this encounter wants you to learn how to split enemies and take them on one at a time. The pebbles you find scattered around are a subtle way of encouraging this. And the bonfire fight teaches what is called pulling, a concept popularized in MMOs. The bonfire group isn't just one group, it's groups of groups that can be pulled individually. This is done by aggroing them, by walking just up to their maximum range such that you alert them into coming after you, or again with pebbles. If you aggro correctly, this fight at first that looks like a nightmare is actually pretty easy. This is less applicable for other monsters going forward, but a solid situational tactic nonetheless. There are various types of enemies, including two enemies with guns and a variety of melee monsters. So not only does it teach you about pulling enemies, it also makes you understand what enemies to pull, 
how to avoid other groups, and which enemies should be dealt first, aka the dudes with the guns. It also teaches you that you can actually run through an entire group of enemies, and that they will eventually reset if you run far enough past them. It's one of the earliest lessons you can learn, that you don't actually have to fight anything you don't want to. Outside of these encounters, Central Yarnum also showcases surprise attacks, shortcuts, ambushes from enemies hiding around corners, and hidden paths, leading to the optional aqueduct area and an optional boss. Verticality plays a big role too, it's a staple of the whole game really, this idea that the architecture is very laced and vertical, just like a city should be, which means we can utilize the mechanic of shortcuts to reduce the amount of lamps present as players figure out the areas. One of my favorite touches is the madman's knowledge placed in the aqueduct, which allows you to actually wake up the doll in the hunter's dream and level up before fighting Father Gascoigne. If the player doesn't find it and skips the cleric beast, which also gives insight, they'll have to fight the boss at level 1. The madman's knowledge can also be used to summon for co-op to make the boss more manageable, so finding it is actually a really big help. This kind of design encourages exploration, and tucking it inside an optional area is a wordless way of reinforcing that behavior. Central Yarnum just has the uncanny ability of teaching players the best way to play the game without actually saying it. It's a nice touch that the trek from the lamp to the bridge is mostly linear, which makes sure players not only don't get completely lost while they're learning the mechanics of the game and the layout, but they also get practice dealing with the challenge of these encounters. Players will die a lot, and the linear section creates a system of repetition, training those crucial elements of gameplay and awareness to the player over and over and over until they click. Once the linear section is over, it splits into various directions and loopbacks so the player can apply what they've learned without it being too much of a hassle to get around, thanks to the shortcut in the elevator. And if they stumble onto this optional boss on the bridge, its highly telegraphed attacks with huge windups allow the hunter to learn best dodging techniques, which, more often than not, is to dodge into the enemy rather than away. It's important to learn this lesson now, and if you don't, the upcoming Bloodstarved Beast will eat you alive. So from a position of educating players through the use of mechanics of its enemies, the layout, the world detail, and the mechanics, this starter area is an absolute banger, and in my opinion, one of the best first levels in all of gaming. If Central Yarnum did not exist, the new player experience would be thrown completely off, and honestly, I'm not sure the game would be as strong. You don't always get games that go out of their way to design a first level that actively tries to teach you the most important things to make you understand the game to carry you forwards. Most games give you the tutorial to teach mechanics, which is always very boring. It's almost an obligation at this point since games want to appeal to everyone, which is why tutorials are typically less interesting than watching paint dry. They then try to follow it up with what I call the baby food level, which is your bog standard easy level 1 that even your grandma can beat. This is great for a Mario game, but Souls games are sanctuary from the slow, often boring lead up and challenge that so many games instill early on. Bloodborne says F that. Souls games often get a lot of flack for being too punishing, but they actually give you all the tools and encouragement to succeed. Sure, there's some cheap gimmicks and bosses thrown into the game to piss you off occasionally, but it's hardly unfair if the player has actively been paying attention and learning from what the game shows them. Granted, it's not always served on a silver platter or pointed out, but it's there if the player actually puts in the effort to find it, and this opening level is the perfect case study in this. The boss fight with Father Gascoigne is probably the best example. It's a tough fight, but his wild hitboxes and ultra-aggressive attacks that catch you if you roll too much should make you realize that the game is trying to tell you something very important early on. Stop rolling away. The boss arena is full of things to trip over and get stuck on. It's very cramped and claustrophobic, which makes random rolling and retreating very hard. Father Gas is here to punish you for not adapting to Bloodborne's aggressive style. Ultimately, Gascoigne weeds out the weak, so the rest of the game can challenge the strong. Rather than spamming rolls or playing defensive, you just have to study his attack patterns and stay active. Read your environment to stay safe. The more aggressive you are, typically the further you'll get in this game. But you have to be smart about it. It's also a nice touch that the shortcut and elevator lead directly to the boss from the first lamp, as the game knows you'll be running back a lot. This being also something that the game repeats for most bosses. Great shortcuts and quick runbacks to boss arenas. I don't know about you, but boss running in prior Souls games was sometimes more painful than being punched in the face. Not to mention, shortcuts sometimes weren't always thought out that well, but in Bloodborne all of this is fixed. As you work your way through the game, Bloodborne's oozing atmosphere in these dark, esoteric places is captivating. 
the detail and immersion is quite powerful, dripping with gothic architecture and monsters of the most ghoulish and macabre. There's no music for the most part, instead gentle ambient fingers tatter weird and spooky sounds in the background. Eerie church bells, women goffing, gone mad, taunting you behind doors and chortling to themselves with strange voices and the blaring and bellowing of dying monsters and things so nightmarish trolloping in the distance. How do you even describe some of the things in this game? What imagination crafted whatever sound the Winter Lantern makes? Who designed this amazing ambient backing track to the Hypogean Jail? It manages to sound exactly what the level looks like, some cursed haunted church prison groaning in its darkest lost history. The same goes for the Upper Cathedral Ward. This is not easy for music to do. What devious bastard rendered this fish monster? How many video games reuse the same enemies over and over? Bloodborne has so many wild creations that will besiege you with terror long after you turn off the game. Forget about all the gameplay they offer, just the awesomeness of their designs must be praised. Have you seen the concept art in this game? It is filled with the most morose wonder. Who the hell is responsible for the tiny alien slug babies slithering around outside this gate? I mean, honestly, who wakes up, goes to work, and has the imagination to draw this stuff? It's chilling and gorgeous together, much like the world itself, really. What freak drew up the many dead bath babies that you can decorate with bloody wet rags? Is there a video game on this planet that has so much love and imagination put into it to not only craft a compelling place to explore, but to populate it with some of the most intriguing, sick and twisted things that both amaze and horrify you at the same time? After Central Yarnum, the player moves on to the Cathedral Ward, which is one of the major lamps that players will be coming back to for many hours to come. The ward represents essentially a crossroads that splits off into many areas, some locked off initially with various gates, or the door to the right of the lamp that leads to the Healing Church workshop. I once saw someone claim that Bloodborne doesn't have the same quality for its world design, that the game is too linear and not very interconnected. At first, this argument seems sort of valid, as there is a strong narrative linearity to Bloodborne's early hours, and it doesn't have that feeling of crushing depth that Dark Souls has, descending into the bottom of Blight Town and fighting Quelog, or that repeat circular woven feeling that everything is connected in some way, the curious stumbling back to Firelink Shrine through the Valley of Drakes and New Londo. Bloodborne is set up differently, with each area overlapping on itself and having lots of shortcuts from generally one main checkpoint. It gives off what I refer to as a hybrid connectivity. The Hunter's Dream is the hub of Bloodborne, and players warp to whatever area they feel like via the tombstones. The truly open world feeling is torn apart by having it, which is the same for Demon Souls and the Nexus. The Hunter's Dream itself though makes a lot of sense, since the story is a game based heavily on the Lovecraft's dream cycle. It fits in with the atmosphere from a narrative angle. It's also nice to have a place where you can marinate after a fat boss kill to the beautiful ambient mise-en-scene. While not having total open world connectivity, the levels themselves can be often looked at as mini hubs that branch off and connect to various other locales, which gives you an open world type of feeling but in a more relative way since the game takes place in a city not spanning an entire world. This allows levels to be far bigger and more complex individually since they don't necessarily need to loop back around completely to other areas. Typically that requires more intensive squishing which can result in awkward transitions, but with the exception of the nightmare areas in Castle Canehurst, you can get anywhere in the game from anywhere else in the game. Granted, you might not be able to completely circle the map in one go and you can't always enter areas from multiple directions, but there is plenty of connectivity. I think the fact that Bloodborne's lack of environmental diversity can make it feel like this isn't the case. Yosefka's clinic, to central Yarnum to the Tomb of Odin, from there through the Cathedral Ward to the Forbidden Woods, from there to Bergenworth, or Hamwick Churnal Lane if you please, or straight back to Yosefka's clinic and one of the most soul-piercing shortcuts ever made. This latter is Bloodborne's undead parish to Firelink moment, and discovering it for the first time made me gasp in pure chilling amazement. The latter is easy to miss, as it's in the basin of the forest, which is dense and full of confusing wraparounds. When I finally found it, I unlocked the gate that I tried to open from the other side 12 hours ago, and I was just stunned. I mean, how many game devs can design a shortcut 8 to 15 hours in advance that connects back to the very first gate the player ever encounters? Many players probably made a mental note of this gate and then forgot about it, but boom, it cashes in on the surprise. It's incredible. You feel so far into the game, you've conquered so much, and you think there's no way it could ever bring you back to the start. And then it happens. 
It's amazing, and the story reward for getting back to the clinic is just one of the most eerie discoveries of the entire game. It is truly disturbing. Personally, this is one of my favorite levels because it gave me the distinct feeling of being lost in the same way I would be in a real forest. It takes away the general sense of direction, making you wander without the presence of distinct landmarks and well-defined city streets or corridors. I felt like I was Frodo and Sam going in circles trying to get to Mordor. Maps and games might tell us where we are, but they hardly build awareness. Since there's no map in this game, your discoveries create your progression. It's like a piggy bank. All of the footsteps are the coins. Each one grows your knowledge. It takes time, but eventually, the piggy bank becomes full. This is very satisfying when you think of it as investment versus return, because you ultimately discover it for yourself. That feeling is intrinsic. It comes from within. Always these feelings, whether it's finding the route through the game, or conquering that boss that kicked your ass all day, they will always eclipse external rewards like achievements, as they are often so artificial. Acquiring this kind of natural direction is encouraged very rarely in games because they often cater to the bottom fish, the player that believes they are incapable of finishing a game without hand-holding, tutorials, or endless explanations inside logs. My least favorite is when a game peppers you with audio calls 24-7, making sure that you know exactly what's going on at every second. With proper motivation which Bloodborne provides, players can be much more capable than they think. Forcing competency and accomplishment breeds dedication, and dedication and in turn encourages continued investment and the strive to be more competent. That's why it feels so good to play a game that beats you down, only to have you be the one to build yourself back up. I really like games like this because they appeal to an older generation of game design, and honestly, finding one is very rare. Anyway, back to world design. The Grand Cathedral can be walked to from the Cathedral Ward, to Yerigol, to the Lecture Building second floor in the Nightmare of Menaces. Times that by 10 when you venture into the DLC, which is a little bit more linear, but still one big beautiful place that follows the same road more or less. The only places you can't get to by running is either Castle Canehurst, which makes sense since the bridge is broken and you need a ghost carriage to take you there, or the Nightmare Areas, which are in a different dimension from Yarnum, so it actually makes more sense that you can't walk to it. So while the connectivity isn't a complete circle, when you travel somewhere, you can get to and see many other areas, most of which have way better land placement than other Souls games which were far too generous. The clever shortcuts and twisting verticality ensure this. The only problem Bloodborne's somewhat linear design poses beyond a limited freedom is getting the items you need. For example, when you start a new arcane character, you might want to use the Tenitris. This requires you to beat a lot of bosses and run through a lot of content, whereas in Dark Souls, you can immediately run for pretty much anything you want like the Great Scythe. Had Bloodborne not presented trick weapons, this criticism would have carried a lot more weight for replayability. Speaking of seeing other areas, that's one of Yarnum's best qualities. Since Yarnum's a city, it's so dense that you can look up to the sky often and to the horizon from various places and see past and future areas. The fuzzy, blurry outlines of the Forbidden Woods from here. This vantage point from here, you get the picture. Many of the landmarks in Bloodborne are tall buildings, churches, and cathedrals that overlook the city and living spaces. And beyond that, the sewage of central Yarnum. It makes you feel like you're in one cohesive environment. Bloodborne is a very dreamy, effervescent-looking game. The sky changes color three times. First, hazy warmth amidst the swirl of a fruity orange cocktail. After Rom, it's a blanket of violet indigo as lesser purples emit from its fiery core, giving you a visual representation of your progress, and, very covertly, relaying the broader scope of the hunter's dream. I had absolutely no idea this was happening on my first playthrough. In fact, the amount of content, lore, and story I missed was likely more than I had acquired. These manifest mostly in the various side quests Bloodborne offers, which are often very cryptic and easy to miss. This is one of the reasons I continued to play this game as the years went by, because I kept stumbling on new things. My favorite element to the arts is the way in which some of the environments are framed. A very underrated part of Bloodborne's central framing is how you're exposed to areas when you first walk into them. For instance, when you jump down into the fishing hamlet in the DLC. The orange moon to your left, the sunken ships to your right, the rain is coming down as you walk into the village through the wet, soggy mud. You can see something under the water. Maybe it's a reflection. Who knows? A ragged resident preaches contempt for Bergenworth. You follow him, listening to his weird story, noticing the dead bodies inside the boats, bobbling and yawing in the shallows. The candles are still lit. Your blood can turn to ice, thinking about the horrors this place endured. The teal Aegean color palette used for this area is perfect for presenting the coldness and wetness of the village misery. Blue for the sadness, the somber story behind Koss and her washed up remains, 
The Orphan is the final battle after all, a fitting end amidst the sinking ships, rain and black sand. Something that perhaps shouldn't have happened, but it did. I found this area to be the most beautiful area in the entire game. It is an artistic dream, and if you think building something like this is easy, from concept to concept art to in-game build to post effects and sound design, you were absolutely crazy. Beyond this area, the DLC is beautiful and incredibly generous and wonderful. Another great one is the bridge into the Upper Cathedral Ward. You approach the bridge, twisted trees overhung, teasing life as they sway side to side. Are they alive, or is it just your imagination? The ward stands proudly in the distance against the soft purple-orange backdrop. You can tell someone probably drew this exact frame when this area was being conceptualized. It just feels like Halloween, a lost, sacred place where nothing is either alive or dead, just acting off pure impulse. The music begins to creep in, marking the impending doom of brain suckers and blue-eyed werewolves. This piece is called Soothing Hymn. What twisted sense of humor from software has. An area where you'll be so creeped out the first time you play it so that you'll know you'll be checking every dimly lit corner. It is truly one of the most palm sweating, ball shrinking areas in the entire game. And I mean nothing is as creepy as a hospital that has had his soul ripped straight from it. It's really only a shame that some of these areas are so small. Bloodborne is very difficult, and the developers knew when they made the game that players will be traversing very slowly, very carefully. Hunters will be dying a lot as well. They'll get lost, loop back around, many attempts will be necessary for each level. Most new players, after all, aren't going to be holding down sprints and mowing everything down. So, better to build inside out, make things more dense. No need to make levels go on and on when they are so challenging. You can build a small area, stuff it full of detail, claustrophobicness, dead-end shortcuts, hard-hitting, frightening enemies. It might seem big, but in reality it might only take you a minute to walk through it if it was empty. Take the square footage of the Upper Cathedral Ward and apply it to any other game. It is small, so small in fact, that it'd be hardly a level at all. But here in this game, it might take you 30 minutes of trepidatious exploration and cautious fighting. And likewise with Bergenworth, which is nothing more than a small pathway that circumvents one single small building. This is the most disappointing area for me, as Bergenworth is essentially ground zero for the entire story, so why not integrate it into a more interesting level? When you know the game inside out, or you're playing multiple new game pluses, it really stands out, especially in a game that screams for replayability. It makes for, quite honestly, two very different experiences because the pace at which you're playing it varies enormously. And for a level like this to be so small, it is a letdown for those who want more, though only because the rest of the game is so goddamn good. The atmosphere, however, is impeccable. It truly does feel like you're venturing into a terrifying place and there's no escape. When the music fades in, which is rare for this game, it makes the hairs on your neck stand out. Item placement as well is genius, baiting players into jump scares and surprise attacks from brain suckers. The lighting is low, amplifying the atmosphere. The shortcut is perfect. There's a very challenging fight in the main hall with the three wolves. It has the perfect set of qualities. I just dearly wish this level had gone on for much longer. Speaking of lighting, Bloodborne is really dark, and that is something that drew me in way more than the dreamlike fantasy settings of all the other From games. Dark Souls might have the Tomb of the Giants, but Bloodborne is far darker overall. The byproduct, design-wise, is that players get a permanent torch that they can flip to to light up areas. This is actually a major gameplay mechanism, because if you have your torch out, you cannot parry with your gun. The only other ways to parry are an arcane spill and the rifle spear, but it's not a guarantee that players will have those items. Thus, the trade-off. Do you want to be able to see better, or have the ability to parry? Think of another action RPG and imagine how dark the darkest part of it is. I haven't played one as dark as Bloodborne, which provides refuge from all the flashy and lurid games. The Chalice Dungeons eclipse even the darkest horror games on the market. Turn off the lights and it becomes a challenge to actually see things in this game. Technically, this isn't even a horror game, it's a third-person gothic action roleplayer, which says quite a lot about cinematography inside games if this is one of the darkest games around. Publishers do not want a game that's too dark, as it might cause problems of appeal to those who have problems with vision. Having someone think twice about purchasing a game because it's too scary, too dark, too hard, that's not something many games take lightly. Money lurks behind that purchase, money pays wages, keeps the light on, and provides fuel for the engine to keep running. If it's running just right, righteous returns can be reaped by the ravenous. Big kahunas love bulging bank account balances, right bro? When we try to appease everyone, we may end up being accepted by many, but perhaps end up never getting adored by anyone. This was somewhat of an annoyance in Dark Souls 2. That game was far too bright in its vanilla state. 
The other areas I adore are Kanehurst Castle and even more so the Research Hall. The Research Hall is an intricate vertical maze of stairways, shafts, and elevators. It's beyond eerie in this perverted, sickly place. It feels sickly because it's green. Again, Bloodborne uses color to great effect. The hospital green lighting and chartreuse lamps. They could have colored these anything, really. These shades, they're just perfect though, to induce the feeling of not just sickness, but frailty and abject misery. The patients, what the fuck are they? Their bulbous brain heads and bloody scrubs paint a disgusting picture, and they provide a huge challenge gameplay-wise. It's nice when you have a game that continues to surprise you with new enemies. Bloodborne does this all the way up until the end. Even if some of them are just redesigns of prior enemies, they do have new mechanics and they fight differently. And there's also my favorite side quest in this game, which involves a certain brain mush substance, but I won't spoil the details. Bloodborne is a terrific video game, and despite this video's length, I feel like I barely scratched the surface with what I wanted to say. I really wanted to portray the beauty of it, the first-rate world art and level design, and the deep, satisfying combat that partners with it. Everything else is just icing on the cake for me. It shares so many things with other Souls games, yet shares so little with them too. It's imaginative, surreal, unbelievably detailed, and extremely fun to play. The love that was poured into every crevice of this game is undeniable, and it is truly one of a kind. It is for me the best From Software game that's ever been made, and that's saying a lot considering how great their games are. I feel though torn putting this video out, knowing that I may have made a mistake, fumbled up my words, or mispronounced something, rambled on far too long or maybe not enough. However, if I'm feeling that way, it reassures me to how important this game is to my gaming history. I've spent so much time with this game, almost 500 hours, so many nights occupied by the bloody hunt. The truth is, it took me a long time to actually beat this game the first time around. I think it was two to three years after it came out. I then sat on it for a long time, reflecting on what the experience meant to me. I really liked it, but so much was undiscovered. I felt almost incomplete with it. I wanted more, so I played it again, and then again, and again, and after hundreds of hours, I ultimately have so much love for this game that I feel like the work I did in this video isn't even worthy. I hope it is, and I hope you enjoyed it though. Bloodborne, like all games, isn't flawless or perfect. There's many things that are quite subjective that could go one way or the other. Builds, gems, runes, PvP, and more. The story itself is based around player initiative rather than curated presentation. Chances are every player will experience it in a different way. Some of them might not get enough out of it. The amount of lore, though, is mesmerizing. Tiny tidbits scattered everywhere in a haunting story with multiple endings. There's so much to talk about, but really, why even talk about it? It's more fun to explore, learn, interpret, and absorb this game in the most natural way possible. No explanations from wikis or walkthroughs do you need, it's about the experience of taking each step at your own pace through the game. Conquering the challenges, inferring what you can, going back and seeing what you missed, and taking in the story in whatever capacity you can or want to. Playing with the various builds that you think are interesting, experimenting. There's so much mystery, so much to discover, so much to find. Umbilical cords? What are they? How do I save people? Will people die if I send them to the chapel? Why is this suspicious beggar killing all the people I sent? What is the history of Bergenworth? What caused the conflict? Who am I, and why am I in this endless nightmare? These are questions that will go unanswered for potentially the entire game, and that is the beauty of playing Bloodborne, and why From Software games are so endlessly replayable. Bloodborne to me is probably my third favorite game of all time. Sequels can sometimes get bogged down with having to cater to fans. They often bring back too much, afraid to alienate and innovate. When a game title ends in 2, 3, or 4, it's tethered to history and expectations. Bloodborne had the privilege to be inspired by Dark Souls, but had no responsibility towards carrying its flame. It simply borrowed parts from the lineage whenever it felt like it could best use them, and then carved its own beautiful, unique identity out, to which many wonderful hours of fun can be drawn from its mysteries. For me, it's almost a perfect video game. And if you somehow missed it, it's never too late to join the hunt.